doesn't change, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then our view of God never changes. You see where that, you see where we get a little bit mixed up with the way the scripture is and the way we are. Our interpretation of that scripture is the way we view God that never changes then. So when we begin to see God in a particular way or understand God in a certain aspect of one of his attributes, then that's what we hang on to and we no longer change. See, but see, God doesn't change, but how many know there's a lot about God we don't know? You take the entire universe and the vastness of the universe of, of everything that God has created, and we know like that much. And then we're like, well, God doesn't change, so there I'm just going to continue to just know this much about him, and I'm going to continue to believe this is the way God is. And maybe the way you believe isn't necessarily wrong, but it just isn't enough. You understand what I'm saying? So we want to be able to expand our minds and expand the way we are to begin to view God in different ways and to see God. See, God is not who you think he is. God is who he says he is, but he's just not who you think he is. He's so much more. And so what happens is, oftentimes, let me give you a couple examples. Maybe one of the ways that you've come to know Jesus is you came to know Jesus as Savior. Is that wrong? It's not wrong, is it? It's absolutely true. However, if that's the only way you know him, you're going to limit yourself now. Because, see, what happens with a lot of believers is they understand God that he's their Savior, which is absolutely true. And in fact, you, you can't be a Christian and not understand that. I mean, that's the, 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 the most basic of all understanding of God uh, connected with salvation, that he's our Savior. He's the one that came to this earth. He's the one that died for us. He's the one that, 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 as we ask him, he forgives our sins, and he cleanses us, gives us a new heart, and we become born again, and he is our Savior. The only problem with that is many Christians never leave that aspect of God, and they never understand Jesus as Lord. And see... And we might say it with our mouth, well, we understand Jesus is our Lord and Savior, but we're only relating to him as Savior. And see, what happens is many people only relate to God in a way of what God can do for them. And therefore, as we were singing this, this awesome song about Shout to the Lord, that last song that we did, and in it, it talks about, I'll give you praise when the sun is shining. And that's what a lot of people do. In fact, most people, that's when they praise God. But see, there was a second line to that song that said, and I'll give you praise in the dark of night. And, what, and we sing that, but what does it mean? That means when everything around you is falling, and you can't see daylight, and things aren't going your way, and things don't look too, too, too good, and you're not feeling real well, you're still praising them. You understand what I'm saying? You're still giving them praise. Now that's understanding God in more than just Savior. That's saying, you're Lord. And you're Lord, even if I'm going through something bad, you're still Lord. You're still worthy. And just because I'm feeling bad doesn't mean I still can't praise you. You understand? There, I mean, there's times that things aren't going well my way, but he's still worthy of my praise. I might not feel like it, but I still praise because of who he is. That's beginning to see the aspect of Jesus as Lord. You know, so a lot of people have a hard time, and what, one, of, one of the ways that we've come to know Jesus is we came to know that Jesus is our friend. How many have come to that realization or that manifestation that he's your friend? He's a friend. The Bible tells us that he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. How many know you just have that one friend that you can just count on sometimes, and that one friend is just there, and, and, and maybe you just kind of feel like you just kind of want to spill your guts every once in a while. You know what I mean? You just need that shoulder to cry on or just, you know... God says, you know what, I'm a friend. I, I, I want to be able to relate to you that way. And that's cool. That's really neat about God, that he, he'll do that. Now, the problem with that is when people only see Jesus as a friend, and he's like their buddy, you know what I'm saying? And that's a, that, isn't that a cool aspect of God? I mean, when Jesus came, you know, we talked about it, was it last week or two weeks ago, that Jesus came as a manifestation of who God was in the flesh, so that we could understand in order to understand who God was, Jesus came to, to demonstrate that. He actually came, and we, we talked about what, he's the logos, that's the Greek word for word, he's the word of God. He's the logos of God. And that actually means an expression of thought. So, so for us, when we want to communicate 
to somebody else, we use words. And a word is an expression of a thought. So when we want to express what we're thinking, we speak it forth. We say it. Sometimes that's not always good, but, uh, but you know, sometimes it's better to keep your mouth shut because some of the things that we're thinking maybe shouldn't be vocalized. But anyway, but that's how we express ourselves. We express ourselves with a word. It's an expression of our thought. So Jesus is an expression of the thought of God. In fact, he said in Hebrews that he was the very express image. I think it's Hebrews 1.3. He's the express image of God, the very expression of God. So when God wanted to express himself to us, he sent Jesus. And he showed us what, what he was like. He showed us who God was. He showed us that he had compassion. He showed us that he had sympathy. He showed us that he had mercy. He showed us that he had anger. He showed us that he, there was things that he liked. There was things that he didn't like. There was a, there, he showed us all kind of aspects about him. He came and, and gathered a group of men, you know, known as the disciples, and he said, I'm just going to be your buddy. But, it, but he was going to be more than that. But one of the aspects was he just, he just enjoyed hanging out with people. Jesus loves to hang out with people. Jesus loved partying. I mean, you, found, you went to town and found the party, Jesus was there. That's where he went. He went to the parties, okay? He went there, and he started loving up on people. And he just went where they were, and he just started shit. Now, I'm not, please don't take that as a license to go do ungodly things, okay? Jesus was not doing ungodly things, but he just hung out. He hung out with people that were fun, and he just had a good time himself. But he never, he never forfeited his morals. Understand? His morals and values always remained, no matter where he was, no matter what crowd he was with. He didn't change with the crowd. You understand what I'm saying? He was who he was. He, he remained who he was, okay? So that's what he did. He would go to these places. He would hang out there. Now watch this. Because when he hung out with his disciples, one of the things that he was known as, here's another aspect of Jesus, is they called him rabbi. He was known as the rabbi. Do you know what a rabbi is? Teacher. He was a teacher. Some of you need to know Jesus as a teacher. Some of you know Jesus as a teacher. Some of you, if you don't, this is another aspect of Jesus. One of the things that happened, especially with Jewish rabbis, is it was a little different than what we're used to, where the pastor gets up or the preacher gets up, and they stand and preach. That's not the way the rabbis did it. They did a little bit differently. It was really unusual. You'd come into the synagogue or the church service, and the rabbi would get up, and, they would, and, and guess what the rabbi would do? He would sit down. When he sat down, it was a, it was a, that was a clue to say he's ready to teach because he's sitting. And see, and this is what Jesus did. It said, it said in the one aspect, where was it, Matthew 5, I think, one, where he went and climbed a mountain and his disciples followed him. And when he saw them, he sat down to teach. Another aspect is he, he had Peter push the boat out from the sea and it said he got into the boat and he sat down and began to teach teach. You see, when Jesus sat down, he taught. We read the one thing wherever, when, when Martha and Mary, remember that, these two sisters, and it said that Mary sat at his feet. This was something that was really indicative of a disciple. And the word disciple is not follower, by the way. The word disciple is learner, one who learns, not one who just follows. That's part of it. But the actual word disciple means learner. And so one who listens and applies what they're listening to. That's what, a, that's what a disciple is. You listen and you learn. And then you follow what they teach. Okay, so that's what a disciple would do with their rabbi. So Jesus was teaching and it said that Mary sat at his feet listening and learning what he was saying. Okay, now we know that today, watch this. Today Jesus has already been resurrected from the dead. Walked on the earth then for 40 days ascended unto heaven, and watch this, seated at the right hand of the Father. So today, Jesus is sitting. And so if Jesus is sitting, then nothing's changed. He's teaching. We're still listening, see? We're still sitting at his feet because he hasn't stopped teaching. Just because he left the earth, he's still sitting down. You understand what I'm saying? If he's still sitting down, he's still teaching, because that's what rabbis do. So he's still teaching, and we're still learning. And he's teaching anybody who's willing to listen, anybody who's willing to receive, anybody who's willing to learn. And so if you don't know that aspect of Jesus, you can get to know him as teacher. Okay? It's okay. What we're doing is there's no wrong answer to how you know Jesus. There's just more. 
There's just more. You see, many people know Jesus as, as the Lord that they worship. And a lot of people don't, can't relate to that. A lot of people can't relate to people that just, I just worship him, I just wor-, which is really awesome. But then a lot of people that, that worship Jesus don't know the other aspect of him. You know, Jesus is a disciplinarian, and they don't like that part. They just like, well, I just want to come into his presence and feel good. You know, if you only come into Jesus' presence and feel good, you don't know enough about him. Because there's oftentimes I come into his presence and I don't feel real good. Because he's a, he, 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 he disciplines me sometimes. He corrects me. It says he disciplines and he chastens those he loves. And so he corrects me. You know what he corrects me with? The word of God. I said the word of God is there to rebuke and to correct was it, is it Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, 16, I think. The word of God is to instruct, to correct, to rebuke. And God uses his word to do that to me sometimes. And most of the time that I get rebuked, it doesn't feel good. But I need it. You understand what I'm saying? You know, I get corrected sometimes. I get disciplined by the Lord. And so oftentimes, sometimes when I'm in his presence, he, he corrects me. There's sometimes I'm in his presence and I just feel awesome. It's really good. Sometimes I don't feel so good, but I come out a way, I, I, I know that it's better. I know it's good for me. You understand? When he corrects me, I know it's good. When he disciplines me and says, you're not doing this right, or you didn't trust me in this area, it doesn't really feel good, but I know it's good. I know it's good, I know it's good for me. You know what I'm saying? And, and so I know, I've learned to, to, to trust Jesus in that aspect. And, uh, you know, that every one of us take on different roles with different people. We just act different ways with different people. And God's the same way. And so what happens is we, we, we can take a, a person who, who, is, who is a man, and, he has, and, and if this man has children, and then he's, he's going to relate to those children in a way that's going to be different than he relates to other people because those are his kids. And he's their father. And he's going to look out for them. He's, he's going to care for them. He's going to provide for them. He's going to... Um, protect them. He's going to do whatever he can to, to, to see that they're raised right. And that's what God does as a father, and that's really awesome. But that same man that relates to his kids is different with his wife. It's a different relationship. He manifests himself differently. There's a different intimacy that takes place with his wife than there is with his children. You understand what I'm saying? He loves and protects her, but he also has a different relationship with her. There's more of an intimacy in, in that relationship. And you know, with God, the same way, do you know that we relate to God, we're his children, and he's our father, and we can come to him and understand him that way and relate to him as our father, our provider, our protector. But we can also come to God, and this is difficult, and especially for men sometimes, but it's difficult to understand that there's also a spiritual relationship with Jesus like we have with our wives. A spiritual intimacy, not physical, but spiritual, that where we get to know one another in a real intimate way. And intimacy is really powerful. And if you don't know that, there's a, you, can, you can start to expand and say, well, I only know God this way. But you can expand. What you know isn't necessarily wrong, but there's more. And so you can read the Song of Solomon, which is an awesome love story, but when understand that from the perspective that it's talking about Christ and his church. Do you know that Jesus says that he is the bridegroom and you are the bride? That's an aspect of God that many people don't know. But you can grow in understanding that. It was interesting that Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, he started writing these commands. And we're reading through it, and it says, you know, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. And he said, he goes down through this, and we think that he's given us a marriage sermon or instructions. But in Ephesians 5, Paul gets to the main point that he's trying to make. He starts explaining to us the relationship between husband and wife. And he said this then. He ends by quoting a scripture that came out of Genesis. And in Genesis was where the first man came into contact with the first woman. And not knowing that the woman was always there, but he just didn't understand her. He just didn't understand where she came from. But remember, God put him to sleep and, and removed a rib penetrated his side, removed a rib, and from the dust of the ground formed another body, and this time he formed a woman. And then, then when, when he presented her back to the man, this is what the man said, and this is a quote from Genesis, verse 31, Ephesians 5, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, 
and the two shall be one flesh. Now that's interesting that Paul takes that very statement then and inserts that into there. And the very next verse says this. This is a great mystery. But I'm speaking concerning Christ and the church. And so we did begin to see that the relationship, that another relationship that God wishes to have with his people is bride and bridegroom relationship. All the other relationships are good and they're all, and, and they're all something that we should be experiencing. But here's where God says, here's another aspect I want you to relate with. I want you to begin to know me in this manner. Okay, and so we see when Jesus came to this earth, the fulfillment of this scripture, when, the, when, when Adam was, was introduced to his wife, he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. I'm going to call her a woman because she came out of man. And we see that Jesus did the same thing. And so Jesus comes to this earth, and he, he begins to, he's the man, and he's missing one thing. He doesn't have a bride. So here he is walking on the earth, and he has no bride. You understand? Because there's only one way he can have a bride. He's going to have to give his life for that bride. See, he's going to have to pay the price for her. Because that was the joy that was set before him. It said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The joy that was set before him was his bride, which is you. That's why he was able to go through with what he did. And so back to the scripture, it says this. It said, for this reason, a man must leave his father and mother. And there's an order to it. You first leave the father, then you leave the mother. And Jesus followed the order. So what happened with Jesus? He was, in, he was experiencing glory in heaven, but it said in Philippians, he emptied himself to come to this earth. He emptied himself of some godly attributes, and he came to this earth as a man. Now watch this, because at that moment, he left his father. You see, he left his father. He came to this earth, lived 33 years, and he went to the cross to die. Now while he's on the cross, just before he's ready to leave, just before he's ready to give up his spirit, he looks down and he has one of his disciples, the one that was closest to him. It was John. John the beloved. John, the man that laid his head on Jesus' breast at the, at the Last Supper. John, who was with Jesus more than anybody else. John, who wrote, the, who wrote about love and understood love more than any other disciple. Jesus looked at him and said, Behold your mother, meaning his mother, Mary, Behold your son. He was turning over his He was turning over his responsibility to his mother, to, to his disciple John. And what he was doing symbolically was leaving his mother. And you say, Well, why would Jesus leave his mother? Because he had already left his father. Why would Jesus leave his father and mother? For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother in order to be joined to his wife. Because Jesus was about to leave this earth. And when he was about to pay the price, he was about to be joined to his bride. That was his purpose, see? That was the whole reason he came. And so that's what he was doing. Now what was interesting is here's John, who probably out of all people ever to live, knew Jesus more than anybody. There probably couldn't be another person that ever lived on this earth. No other human being would ever had had the relationship that John had with Jesus. And yet John finds himself on the island of Patmos, years later. And he hears a voice. He hears a voice. And he said, this voice sounded like a trumpet with the sound of many waters. You all got to experience that a little bit when you went to Niagara Falls, what a sound of many waters is. It's pretty loud. And so he hears this voice like the sound of many waters. And it says, I turn to see. I want to get a glimpse of who, who's speaking to me. Because I'm not recognizing the voice. Now this is the man that he spent a long time with. The guy he knew pretty well. Probably more than any other human being ever. He turns around to look. And there's Jesus, but he don't recognize him. He doesn't even recognize him. He's looking, he's like, what the heck is that? He's standing there. He's got, it, said that his, it said that there's a sword coming out this guy's mouth. His hair is white as wool. It said his face, is, his countenance is like the sun shining in all its strength. You ever try to stare at the sun? Now this is what it was, this is, he's trying to explain this. He's trying to, to, to put into words what he's seeing. The point is, he, does, he has not known Jesus in this way. 
And Jesus is manifesting himself. Manifesting means make known. He's revealing himself to John in a way that John had not yet known. And see, this is the way God is with us. He wants us to expand our understanding of who he is. Maybe you've known him as friend. Maybe you've known him as savior. Maybe you've known him as Lord. Maybe you've known him as father. Maybe you've known him as brother. Maybe you've known him as lover. But the thing is, he wants us to experience every one of those aspects with him at, di at certain times and at different things that we're going through. God will choose to reveal himself if you'll be open-minded. The only thing that will limit God from revealing himself to you is you closing your mind to who he is and believing that you have them all figured out and this is just the way he is, this is the way he does things, this is what he does. Say, wait, what if he wants to do something different? You see, that was the whole, do you understand that the Pharisees knew the word of God better than anybody yet couldn't figure out who Jesus was? They had more education and more learning in the scriptures and yet still couldn't figure him out. Because he did not do it the way that they thought. And so here's the disciples, they're in a boat, and, and they're going across because Jesus told them to do this. Why don't you go across the other side? And they're out in the boat, and all of a sudden this storm comes up, and the wind and the waves, and here they are, experienced fishermen, experienced boatmen, some of them, and they just they can't go, they can't move, they're, they're in the middle of the sea, and it says, now here comes Jesus, he comes to them. It says he, he went to them. But they did not recognize him. They looked. They didn't see Jesus. You know what they said? It's a ghost. It's, it's a ghost. It's not even, who's this? Here he is. Here's God manifesting himself to them. And it's something that they had not yet seen. Something that they, they had not comprehended. He was doing something they didn't expect. Here comes Jesus in a form or a way that you've not yet seen. Are you going to be able to receive it? Or are you going to say, that's not the way God would do things. God doesn't do it like that. God doesn't look like that. Maybe he does. Maybe your mind is too limited to understand that maybe God's different than you think he is. Maybe God will do things that you don't believe he will do. See, the Pharisees couldn't get past the fact that Jesus did things on the Sabbath that they think a godly man should never do, but he did. They couldn't get past the fact that Jesus didn't do things according to their law, or at least what they, their interpretation of it, but he did. He did things completely contrary to what they were expecting. And because he did things that were outside their mindset, they could not accept who he was. And if they could not accept who he was, they could not receive from him. And see, if we cannot accept who God is, we cannot receive from him. That's why it's so important to get ourselves prepared that when God begins to manifest himself differently to us, and I'm telling you, he's going to. I'm telling you that he wants to do that. He wants to reveal himself to you in ways that you've not yet seen him. But he cannot do that. He cannot do that until you allow him, until you can expand and believe that he'll do those things. Believe that he can, he can be whoever he wants to be. He can do whatever he wants to do. And don't, you don't box him in, because once you box him in, you limit yourself of what you could believe for. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? We want to remain open-minded. We want to have our minds renewed upon the Word of God. We don't want to take a scripture that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever and misconstrue it because of our limited thinking. He is the same. It's just that we don't know everything about him. And he wants to expand our knowledge of who he is. Does this make sense to you? Okay, this is where we want to get to. We want to get to where God can do whatever he wants to do in our lives. He can say what he wants to say. He can be who he wants to be. Because you see, when he came to those disciples in, on the sea, when he came walking, there's a scripture. It's kind of, it's kind of uh, interesting. It said he would have passed them by. 
he was going to walk right past them. He was going to keep on going. The only reason he stopped is they invited him into the boat. They finally recognized who it was, and they invited him to be a part of it. Had they not done that, he'd have left them in the middle of the sea, and he would have walked, he would have, he would have walked to the other side. But when they said, it's, it's, it's him, and that's when Peter said, Lord, if it's you, let me walk on. See, these things start all coming out in this, in this passage. But the point that I'm trying to make is, if, if we don't recognize him and change who we think he is, he's, going to keep on, he's still going to go. He's still going to move. You see, one of the things the Lord showed me years ago is many churches, many Christians, lock themselves into a particular doctrine and they camp at that. We call it camping. Camping means you ain't going nowhere. They kind of stick your roots down and say, this is what I believe. And when they do that, they limit now. They limit what they're going to believe God for. And so they, they, they understand, and, and, and God reveals himself in a certain way. And so what happens is, um, you, you, you know, a denomination is built upon, a denomination was found, founded or formed upon, you know, a, a few different criteria. One was government. Some, some denominations are formed directly on government. Others were, were, were formed directly on doctrine, you know, some, a particular doctrine. Um, and others were formed upon a move of God, a particular revival that maybe took place. For instance, you know, the Pentecostal denominations were formed from Azusa Street and that particular, you know, movement, the charismatic movement, churches came out of that movement. Okay, uh, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Congregational, those, those particular denominations came about as a result of particular government, how, how churches were governed. Okay, Baptists, uh, faith, these were doctrines that, the, that these particular denominations formed, which are all good. Okay, no, no, I'm not putting any down. They're all good. They're all accurate. They're all, they're all an aspect of the Word of God or all an aspect of God, which is awesome. Now, where the problem lies is when they say it's only this way. There's no other way. See, it's just this way or no way. You understand what I'm saying? That's, that's it. And so when, it, when you get to that, now you're limiting what you can believe God for. Because you say, well, this is what we've always been grounded in, so we're not going to change. But see, God is ever, I know he's unchangeable in his, in his, in his ways, but he's, he's ever changing us. Always changing what we who we are and, are and bringing us, you know, along. And so what, and, and the analogy that God gave me with this is when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they were led by God's spirit. Now, they weren't led by an inner spirit. They didn't have that at the time, but it was an outward spirit that was manifesting in a cloud. Cloud by day, fire by night. Remember that? And so what happened is God would lead them out with this cloud and whenever the cloud would just kind of stop, they made camp. Said, okay, cool. God says, you know, we're going to rest right now. We're going we're to put our tents down and we're just going to stay here. Well, then what would happen is after they were there for a time, the cloud would move. And when the cloud moved, what God was expecting was you to uproot your tent, you know, and let's go where God's going next. But what happened was they didn't all do that. Some of them said, well, we don't want to move. The cloud would get up and it would move and it would go to another spot. And those that were following the Lord would get up and move along with the cloud. But those who said, no, nah, I ain't moving. This is the way I believe. I've always believed it this way. This is the way it is. It was good enough back then. It ought to be good enough now. It's going to stay here. Guess what happened? The enemy came in because they had no protection. Because they were, they were left there by themselves. And the enemy would come in and slaughter them. The stragglers, the weaklings, the ones who didn't have the faith, the ones that wouldn't go with God, the ones that just said, I ain't going anywhere else, staying right here. And see, and this is what happened to a lot of people in church, over in church, hist in church history over the years, everything happened. People just got locked into a particular doctrine, locked into a particular move of God, and they weren't open to anything else. And when you do that, you basically are ensuring your death sentence as far as moving on with God. And so in order to, to, to get life back again, we find out where the cloud is and keep moving with it. And just say, hey, that was good then, but God's got something better tomorrow. Yesterday was good, 
Today's better. Tomorrow's even going to be, you know, better than that. And so we keep moving with God. We keep allowing, we don't just say, this is it and there's no other way to do things. We say, hey, this was good, but this is better. And I can't even wait for what's tomorrow. God's got something more. He, he wants to continue to reveal things to you. It is perpetual motion. We keep moving forward. You understand what we're saying? We keep moving forward. We don't just plant ourselves upon one particular way of thinking, one manifestation of God, one move of God. We don't, we don't want to do that. It's good and enjoy it, yes. And it's not saying it's wrong. It's just saying there's more. Your way of thinking about God isn't wrong. It's just more. There's more available. You understand? And when we're open to it, when we can renew our minds upon it, God will begin to reveal himself to us in new ways. The Bible tells us that his mercies are new every morning. Every morning there's something new. Can you believe that? There's something new every morning. We will never outgrow understanding God. We will never get to a place where we get them figured out. Who would want to serve a God that you can figure out? He's so much bigger than we are. So much greater than we are. Let's, let, let's break the mindsets that we have, we all have them, of where we have limited God in our lives. Let's stand on our feet. Heavenly Father, you are so amazing. There are so many things about you that we have not yet discovered. Things that you want to reveal to us. Things that you, you want us to know. The writer of Hebrews said, there's so much more I want to say to you. But you become dull of hearing. Lord, let us not be those that are dull of hearing. Let us not be those that, that are, that are single-minded. Let, let, let us not be those who are, who are simple-minded, who are just locked into one particular area. Lord, let us be open. Open to your word. Open to your ways. Open to who you are. Open to receive more. Let our minds be renewed upon you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for new ways that you're going to show us, new things about you, more discoveries, Lord God, that we can grow and mature in who you are. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 God bless you all. Love you guys. Have a great day.